guys for coming today. Uh, they asked me to come up and teach the class for you guys, and I'm really excited about it. Kind of nervous, but uh, we're going to be tying a few different stone fly patterns today. So uh, the first one we're going to tie is basically like a juiced up Pat's rubber legs type stone fly, but we're going to use a woven abdomen technique, use the Polish weaving technique to make the abdomen of the fly. So it's a pretty simple techniques, just kind of takes a little bit of patience. Uh, First thing I do is I use this uh, Moonlit ML04 or 54 hook. It's a nymph slash streamer hook, and I'm going to use it in a size 8. And I like to tie this pattern in a size 8 or a size 10. That's the thing. Um, I don't know if any of you guys really like those jig hooks, but I kind of do like the jig hooks. I like to fish the Euro nymph style. So what I'm going to do with this straight shank hook is I've got these beading pliers that I use. I have a round grip on them so they don't hurt the shank of the hook. But if I grip this hook, about right here and give it just a slight push. I've got one of those cool bent shank nymph hooks now and it gives the fly a little bit cooler profile. So before I even put my bead on, well I guess I can throw the bead on first. I want to tie in that first set of rubber legs as the antenna on the fly. So I'll leave the bead back at the bend of the hook <coughs> and just dress my hook like I would any other bug. So Oscar, you're on the team. The Moonlit team? Yeah. yeah, I am. What kind of bead is that? This is a 4.6 millimeter bead. Uh, okay, so when you do this pattern, I pick four little pieces of this rubber leg. It's the size medium centipede leg from Fish Tech. And when I tie these in, these kind of tend to be a bugger for people, but I watch Cheech on Fly Fish Food do a cool rubber leg technique. So what he does is he just pinches this thing right in the middle of the, the leg and holds onto the two ends. And then you can just pull that up and set it right on the side of the shank of the hook where it'll stay put for you. And I give that a couple of wraps. And then I come back a couple of wraps so that I'm actually behind that tie-in point. And then I can bring this guy back across and he'll stay put when I tie him into the other side. Petrov. And then I can just kind of orient those little antenna towards the eye of the hook and then they'll stay put like that. And then I actually just whip finish right here and take this off so that I can readjust that bead. Those legs like to get caught in the whip finisher, but. Okay, now we can seat that bead and just dress the hook like normal again. You know what? I haven't had too much trouble with the moonlit hooks breaking. I have had a few of them that come in with like plating issues here and there, little stuff around the eye of the hook or an eye that's not closed. I fish a lot, almost 99% barbless hooks. And so I've used a lot of the fire hole hooks and I've used a lot of the moonlit hooks. Yeah, and I, like, I like them, but I know a guy that breaks them all the time. See, I have, a, I have the opposite effect. I, I break more fire hole hooks than I do moonlit hooks fishing. Really? My, my Euro Nymph rig is a... I run a main line of like 15 pound fluorocarbon for my main running line and so I pull snags out most of the time instead of like breaking them off. Right. And the moonlit hooks a lot of times will bend out and then I'll just take my hemostats and turn them back around and keep on fishing them and they, cool. they, they work. I've got flies in my tr headliner in my truck that have been bend out 25 times in a day up in Big Cottonwood Canyon. So <laughs> if, if it keeps working I just keep doing it. And I have had a bunch of fire hole hooks break right at the bend of the hook. like. Right, right where you tie in your yeah. tail or something, they just ping, break off right there. Time. But I think that comes with any hook company, just tempering and batches and all that stuff is different. But. Okay, so now that we've got the bead in place here, we can move to the back of the hook and tie in our tail section, which is just another one of those rubber leg guys. And it's the same technique there. Pinch that to the middle. Turn it to the side. Come back. Turn that over the top. And then I like to try and just bury all of that little bit of rubber nub there just to make sure it's tied in nice and tight. And I like to cut these guys basically body length, so the shank of the hook length here. Kind of trim those. Same for the antenna. It's a little oversized if you're trying to be anatomically correct for a stonefly, but 
I think the fish eat this just because those things wiggle. <laughs> I don't think it means anything other than that. Okay, uh, now we tie in a wire for a rib and just tie that completely parallel to the side of the hook shank facing you. This is a medium. This is its size medium, and this is actually a hot orange color. And once that's tied in, I just give that. And you don't have to worry too much about building bulk on the body of the fly. You can kind of get away with a few extra thread wraps and stuff because you are going to build a whole bunch of stuff onto the fly. Uh, after that rib is tied in and bound down, now I put a, I guess you'd call this a dorsal line of thin skin, and I do that with like an eighth inch wide strip, and I cut a tiny little triangle at the tip just so I have an easy tie in point. And I tie that guy in right on top of those two rubber legs. And as soon as that's in, then you can kind of orient it so that everything sits straight. Also to mention, I started the fly with uh, 70 denier uh, UTC in, oh no, it's, uh, Se it's Danville's 70 denier. And I use that thread because I can bulk up the body of the fly and even out the underbody easier. And then once I switch over from the weave, I'll go back to uh, the nano silk, which is like a GSP type thread. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so on the woven flies, you usually pick two contrasting colors of thread so that you have that segmentation when you weave it up. And I always tie in the underneath side of the fly towards me, and the opposite side is the darker colors or the top of the fly. Because most of the stone flies you see have a lighter underbelly. So I tie that in right up here where that bend is. That's going to be where my thorax point is on the fly too. So I tie this in, just give it two wraps and let it hang. Set that guy back in nice. What's that material? This is... Uh, DMC embroidery floss. It's just like the stuff oh, you buy over at uh, Joann's or the craft store. And once I've got that guy set, then I just rotate my vise just enough to tie in this other side. And then this is the part where you build in that body. So I usually come back about a third of the way with my thread and then roll these two tag ends over and then build that or bind that down rather and then trim off that waist. Now here is where I was talking about building up that body and building just a slight taper. And so I'm careful as I tie down those two pieces of embroidery floss to come back to that tying point, or the tie-in point, rather. And then I just spend a couple of seconds here just kind of reassessing everything and making sure that there aren't any lumps or any uh, dips or divots because all that stuff kind of translates into a really difficult weave. It's When you do the weaving thing, it's really important to make sure that underbody is smooth and flat and gives you the profile you want. Otherwise, it'll be hard. Your weave will tip around and move around and it'll be real bad. And then you do want just a slight bit of taper, but not too much. And when you feel like that's about right, then I usually go back uh, after I whip finish this, because you have to get this out of the way so that you can do the weaving technique. And this will be where I end with the 70 denier thread. So whip finish that guy and tie it off. And then I towards the tail so that the, so it's smaller at the bend of the hook and then just barely gradually and so then what I'll come back and do is I'll take these flat hemostats that I have and I crush this thread so that I can actually force it to be a flat profile and then I can turn it to the side and I can kind of tune up that shape too so that I get the shape that I want in that body and it does help a lot just to make it flat even if your body's a little bit wonky Okay, this is where we're going to turn the vise, Todd. This is the hard part. It's actually s the hardest part I is know, just keeping the tension on your thread. If you if you can keep constant tension on the thread, then it goes pretty quick and pretty easy. So you always start with the lighter color, which is the underneath color, and keep them basically committed. The one's going to be the underneath, and the one's going to be the top. So all that you do for the weave is bring the underneath to this side, 
bring it up and cross it, and then bring the other one across the top. So then this one stays back underneath the bottom again, and then they just you just alternate. So as you cross, That's you stay on top. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so see, each of those weave finishes creates that little segment. Do you, do you pull them tight as you weave it? Tight-ish. You don't want to pull too tight because what then will happen is the thread itself will compress so tight that mm -hmm. it kind of looks crappy. You kind of want to try and keep <coughs> it just steadily tight. And you want to try and also keep these fibers of the, of the floss flat as you can. They'll mm -hmm. tie in and yeah. seat better if they're <coughs> flat. Is that embroidered silk? No, silk is hard as hell to weave with. <laughs> oh, you, that is you, so can't, slick. you can do it, but it's really easy. Yeah, yeah, this is Walmart yeah. or Joanne yeah. or any yeah. of those Michael's places. Sure. Michael's, any of those Hobby places. Lobby. See, then when you get up here to that end of that thorax <laughs> point where we tied in the, or where the bend in the hook is, then you have to just pinch that tight with your finger. And then we can go back to this this view and you guys can see what's going on again. <coughs> then take these things and just pull them down straight and tight and that's when I get back to the nano silk and I do this because this is a really kind of bulky material and I want to be able to make sure it's bound down real tight. Is that a 12 or 8? This is the 18 aught so it's 30 denier. You know I cut my biops last week with that stuff. Yeah you can you can do some really neat tricks with elk hair too when you're doing caddis cut, patterns cut and stuff you can just slice it right off yeah. So then I go two or three wraps in front of that little bundle of thread, and then I go right back beneath it. Oh no! And then once that's tied in, I'm gonna adjust yeah. my hook there. Okay. So once those are captured on the side and in front with a couple anchor wraps, then I will just continue that until I can pull it back to that same point. Wow! I can do my wife's French braid now. <laughs> If you can do this to your daughter's hair, you're going to win big brownie points, man. <laughs> That's really cool looking. Okay, so now. Can you that over so we see the Yeah, absolutely. Side? So then you see the underneath side. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That is nice. It's like a real bug. It turns into a very, very believable bug. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it, that segmentation is pretty awesome. Okay, so now that that's all bound down, it's bring that thin skin piece across for that dorsal section. So you got that modeling and that kind of fun look there. And I'll do that come up to where I can wrap it over itself. You're still at the nano. Oh, yeah. Just okay, and then now that that's tied in, it's just uh, running the rib. But with this uh, Polish rib, you kind of have to pay attention which way your first wrap goes, because that's going to dictate which way your ribs apply. The way that I do it with my left hand going underneath each time, it, it's a counter rib. So I'm going to wrap towards myself. So you're countering. Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to come back like this and go one time right around the base of those little biot tails. And then on this one is where I start to step up and you put that rib right between each of those knuckles on the weave to kind of accentuate that segmentation there. And that weave gives you the spacing. Right? Yep. So it's it all a perfectly segmented body every looks time. really tight. And then I just couple in front, couple That's behind, awesome. and then I like to pinch that wire right there and just trim it off with a pair of flush cut wires. Where in the world did you get those? These are also at the Hobby Lobby. These little flush cut guys are awesome for everything from like articulation wire and cougar uh, yeah. wire. Yeah. It's they're the only way to go. What are they called? They're just flush cut pliers. Flush cut yeah, you can get well, they're, right. Uh, jewelry pliers. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, they're like three, three to five dollars at almost really anywhere, they're, and they're terrible. awesome for that kind of stuff. Why well, ruin your scissors, right? Exactly. Okay, so now we've got the body, and we've got antennas, and we've got tails. We need to do legs, and we need to do a wing case. So on the way, on the legs, it's super simple. One knot, and this is going to be the back leg and the front leg. So do both of them, get them ready. Do the knot in each one. So why the knot? Just to give it kind of that kinked leg, like See a, this right here. Oh, he's got it kinked. It just kind of gives it a little bit more life. You know how they have those little. I like to tie this pattern. I like to tie stoneflies a lot with biot tail or biot legs and stuff, and it kind of gives a little bit life, more lifelike. You look. put a knot in those too. 
Yeah, I was gonna say. I've tried nodding I've by got a couple some times, of those, and even if you can manage it, they don't look that awesome. They kind of get m mangled or whatever. Uh, yeah. So I want to put a little mm -hmm. bit of dubbing on there just to kind of even out this thorax section, so that <coughs> when I do tie in stuff, it doesn't crisscross and go crazy. And I'm gonna do just a tiny little bit of a. I won't do the dubbing loop, but just this uh, remix dubbing. It's basically squirrel dubbing. Is all it is. Squirrel. I believe it's squirrel on a mix of a little bit of a hairs. Well, I notice they've got waxed panel thread now. The, they've got a waxed thread. It's a more. It's more like a pre-waxed UTC than oh. a na than nano silk. It's not. So it's, it's not. not it's not the silk. It's not bulletproof. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. But it is kind of cool stuff. If you're. I mean, if you're tying like lots of soft tackles and little things like that, it's going to be real good for that. I'll just hold it in for a minute. What's that? The wire is red. The wire on this is hot orange, I hot think. Orange. Hot orange. Yeah, and it's the uh, ultra wire right there. Okay. What did you do to improve your dubbing technique? I listened to a guy a couple of years ago that basically said every time you put dubbing on your thread, take off like two thirds of it. <laughs> Don't just don't just go, just go light as you can and just build it up. Yeah, because it it can really mess up the way of a fl a fly looks. Okay, so now to tie these legs in, you take that little kink section, kind of like a hopper leg there, and just pinch wrap it. Just gauge the length, hold it in place with your thumb. Oh, that's how. And then tie that in. So then you see that guy's just nice and tight. And then we'll we'll brace that out with a little bit of dubbing between the wing case, and you'll see. Then we rotate it across. Or rotate it around and do that other same thing on the other side. And these, this pinch wrap is the key to like so many things in tying to make it so much easier for yourself. And just gauge that, and just hold that rubber leg right in place so it doesn't go anywhere. And then once it's done, or once it's in place, you can adjust it slightly with a little bit of a stretch. So you're one of those big, big, tall naturals. Well, <laughs> uh, maybe I don't know about that. <laughs> That's your compliment. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and give that a little ball of dubbing now to separate those two groups of legs just so that you can, so they have the action that you want in the water anyway, so they don't foul on themselves. Is anybody fishing today? I did yesterday. <laughs> you did yesterday? And you said you hit the middle? Yeah. And it was a snowbank hellhole? Lots of fish. You get into a midge hatch. The buffalo midges, yeah. yeah. That's good to hear. You should hear <coughs> Mickey's speech on yeah. buffalo midges. <laughs> Did he have a speech on buffalo midges? Oh, yeah. There's no such thing. Really? Yeah. They're gnats. They're gnats. Okay. I, I mean, you were right. They were <laughs> I can't. I can't. Man, I gotta look. I, if I can find some photos. Of I was just gonna say. I swear I've seen some photos. Okay. Now that those guys are cooperating slightly, those legs always like to go where they want to go anyway. But okay. So those guys are there. I trim these all off to the same length, which is, like I said, a little bit obscene for a natural stonefly, but. Pretty great for a wiggly trout snack. <laughs> and all the wing case is is a little piece of thin skin. And I use the darker color for that just for those little wing pads. And all I do to make that is just cut a, like a quarter inch wide strip. And then I take these little, the hole punch, and I just nip the very back edge to give it that little profile. Oh, cool. And then just, then just cut off a little triangle. Now i got to find more crap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so then I like to get some wax on my thread when I'm dealing with the thin skin because it likes to slide around a little bit when it's tying this guy in. And it's the same thing again. Just set it where you want it. Bring that in. 
and you can kind of just, with this nano silk, if you wiggle it like that, do you see how the tip of that triangle just disappeared right yeah. into the bead? Yeah. yeah. So then all you gotta do is find that little guy down with a couple of turns of thread. Whether I actually saw it or not is... It, it just, <laughs> it, it, once you get that little t triangle in there it against the bead, it. Well, no, it didn't cut it, it just, uh, if you just slightly pull it, just tucks that little tag in. Oh, and put it in it under the cut it. Uh, in I think it can if you're not careful. But, but biopsy, yeah. man, things go like And then it's just a simple <coughs> whip finish to finish the fly. Just one wing case? I just do the one wing case. I, I've done a few of them with multiples, but it, this is definitely like an impressionistic kind of thing where yeah. it's just kind of wanting to be its... Well, well it's probably not he's count. not going to see it. Yeah. If they can count, I'm screwed already. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, this one I, liked, I told some guy the other day, he's like, because I posted this on my Facebook page, and somebody's like, well, you know, trout can count. And I was like, well, I tie them with four legs so that I had insult to the injury when I stick this in their face. <laughs> Oh man, that did only have four legs. I'm an idiot. <laughs>
sulk utensil, you should also be using that. That that stuff's like strong as bullets. It's made to be sewing thread, and it's comes in a thousand different colors. Yeah, and it's so tough. So another. Yeah, yeah, way, way, way better, way, way better. And it comes in cooler colors. <laughs> I don't know about that. Okay, so uh, with that rib tied in, now I like to have these nymphs weighted, and since we're not running a bead on this one, I'm just going to use lead wire. Hope that everybody's okay with it being real lead. It's just how I end up doing things usually. It's like I don't I don't like to tie the wire on or the lead wire in the beginning because then I have to like build a body over it. And if if as this goes, I can just bury this in my pr process easier. O two O. Uh, anytime I use lead wire on my flies, I like to glue it down. So I just Do you use, use lead still? Yeah, I'm not a true hippie by any sense of the means. <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem is that it's, you know, the pins like half the weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have, I've tried a few of the other, they have like the, I think they have tungsten, like tungsten wire now, like, yeah. and it's wicked expensive. <laughs> and I don't know. I've had this kicking around in my stuff for a long time. It doesn't ever run out, it seems like. Mostly because I switched to almost 100% just tungsten beads, but. Mickey was telling us last week that tungsten beads aren't really tungsten, they're an alloy. They're a mix, yeah, they're a mix of tungsten. There's another company, there's a company that's just recently come out called uh, TechStream, and their big thing, their big marketing thing is that they're 98% pure tungsten. I don't think that means anything, man. I mean, you might you might get a couple of micrograms more weight per bead or something like that, but it's it's not really worth the trouble. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> okay, so now I'm gonna do a dubbing loop on this body since we uh, decided to not kill ourselves with more weeding all the rest of the time. <laughs> It's a good way to kill a few hours. I mean, I do t I do fly tying just as much for the fun of it as I do for the function of it. So, it's my sanity. I came out of a divorce several years ago and was crazy. So I learned how to tie to keep myself from wanting to kill people. <laughs> and it's way better. I didn't even try to shoot, man. I, I was running the other way. I couldn't shoot. I did. I moved to Clearfield. <laughs> might not have been far. <laughs> might not have been. <laughs> you got to laugh so you don't cry sometimes, man. No, this. It, have you ever used this dubbing loop tool? This dubbing tool from Loon. Yeah. This is. Oh, this one's got the shepherd's hook on it, and it comes with the little gator grip too. So if you ever do those complex twist buggers where you mix like schloppen and stuff together and polar chenille, you can clip any kind of bundle of things together and do a dubbing loop with it. It's, it's pretty rad. Did you know what I have to do? I I got one of those twister things. Yeah. <coughs> But when I go to wrap it, it always falls off. So then I cut this mm -hmm. and I clip a clip a little gator gripper. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense to me too. Because yeah. I I would lose it. Okay, so I'm gonna just get this guy out of the way here. With a little I'm blocking the view, but no, I'm not. Just wanted to see what that tool looks like. Guess I'm going to fish tech for that. <laughs> Uh, fish tech, or I think you can get it on uh, Fly Fish Foods website too if you're yeah. into it.
It's got that dubbing loop wound up. Trap your thread and tie it all. Once that's there, and then I like to really kind of brush this out as much as I can when it's in this stage to kind of trim that all back out. Once it's all ratted up like this, because I did want to keep that taper, then I just take my scissors and kind of clean that up. It's a stonefly too, but it's kind of like a spay type of inspired kind of thing. Yeah, use some soft tackle and some old school materials like oval tinsel. And then whenever you do a dubbing loop or any kind of dubbing body, you should always wrap your rib counter to that just so that it doesn't fall down between the wraps of thread from the other step. Really? I've literally... I, I don't want to find you again. I, yeah, I would love to see it, because I literally have done the, the test where I will wrap a, like a palmered body and then rewrap it the other way, and you can lose the rib. Like, it'll slide down in between the grooves of that wrap, you know, because it's, it's going the same direction. So it probably is less of an issue if you have a, a thicker ribbing material. But if you're doing smaller flies with, like, white wire ribs and things like that, it'll definitely slide down in between the creases. I'm going to find it. I think it's in the space of supply chain books. I don't know. So okay. I, I, I look for that and I'm like, really? Okay, so now that we've got this tied in and we've got that body, we want to be about two-thirds of the way up the hook shank here so we have that much space between the eye. And now I want to tie in uh, the thin skin piece that I use for the like, wing case on this bug right here at the back of the thorax section. And I just tie that in and bind it all down tight. I'm not gonna That's worry. That's just a strip. That's just a strip, yeah, just a straight strip. Okay, and then now we need to tie in our hackle feathers. On this, uh, I've got a bunch of different stuff here, but this is some barred dark ginger, really pretty stuff. I used uh, the one that I showed you, I used this saddle hackle, but it's got a little bit longer yeah. fibers, and I wanted to try and trim, trim it down, yeah. So I like to tie this in skinny in first so that we get that taper. And just tie it onto the side of the hook facing me. And then double that back, turn it down, trim off that waist. Oh, you tied the tip in. I tied the tip in, yeah. So now when I do this, I do this and I just it's kind of gross. Dave uses the little cool uh, moist uh, sponge because he's cooler than me. But I just preen those back, each wrap, and try to keep it almost in the same place because you just want to build up that big clump of fibers. And then you'll preen it all down and wrap the thin skin over the top of it. It's a little bit messy to start with, yeah. Some of those fibers that are trapped. So that's the one third? That's at, basically at two thirds is where, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, and then on that, you can kind of just take those hackles Preen them all down one way. And once they are, then you can pull that first layer of thin skin over the top. Actually, I'm going to do the dubbing and build that up a little bit. I like the dubbing under the thin skin because it kind of helps give it something to support it. The uh, thin skin itself 
doesn't like to be stretched, like I was saying earlier. So if you keep something underneath it to kind of give it that profile that you like. of wraps and then double that thin skin back and then you're ready to do another section of hackle. Just the same, same one now. They'll probably each vary slightly just based on the feather itself, but. I think I actually liked the feathers I used on the first draft better. I saw the pretty feathers in one of those this time though. Yeah, they are. The uh, feathers that I used on that first version of this are about 60 years old. They were very brittle. <laughs> they were kind of hard to tie with. Another little bit of dubbing to help tame those. They're a little frizzier than that last feather it was. The loon team? No, I, I, I'm on the moonlit team only because I initially wanted good price on hooks, <laughs> and but no, no, I, I realized I was kind of stuck in this like devastating hobby that was never going to leave me, and so I needed to try and find a way to make it more pro like less expensive anyway, but it didn't work. Now I get hooks at a better price, and I still spend way too much money on fly tying stuff. So. We all kind of are in that club, aren't we? Not so much, huh? Oh. Seriously. That was the first time it happened? No, this, I had all my still water stuff in the back of the garage locked up. Next, I went next to my garage, underneath the, the, my bedroom window, with the dog, in between the middle of my scroll rod. Oh. And it was like four rods, five or six reels, a piece of school, 20 boxes of flies, and then it was about No, they don't. They don't believe you. You're telling me that this box of feathers and fur. <laughs> <laughs> they, they gave me. Some, I mean, I got some money, but what they did is they discounted everything because I had you know, 20 years old flies. I mean, I. So you need a better insurance policy. Well, it was. It was bad. I haven't had anything like that happen. Yeah. There you well, go. Like auto owners and old fixtures, but. Well, that's good. I have pictures of everything. So if you actually had the pictures of all that stuff, do you think you could get them to cover you on that? I, I, have, I submitted a whole bunch of pictures, and Cause it's I couldn't come up with everything that's in the back of that stuff. Well, and you couldn't come up with, some of it doesn't have like an actual tangible value. No. What they ended up doing is they took and sent it to some national company that does that, and then they, um, I don't know how they figured it out, but it was only like, I think I got $8,000. For $8,000? That happens in my line of work when people get all their tools stolen out of their truck. Oh, yeah. It's a really rotten thing to have happen. I 
had that. I've only had that happen one time, and I know exactly who stole all my junk. <laughs> and I confronted them, they denied it, and that was the end of the whole thing. It was like, oh man, I can't do anything about this at all. No, nobody cares. Nobody's going to do anything. Well, there is that. But I feel like that's one of those things that isn't like as much about creating a brotherly love kind of deal. I want to hurt people. Well, and I don't I want to be the one doing it, not sending somebody else to do it, man. So you got three sections? Three little wing case sections there. And then you just lacquer ahead or finish ahead on it. The other one I tied looked a little better, I'll be honest, but This is a four. It's a size four, yeah, size four. I'm going to tape this off and put some black thread on there for the head. Yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. Or even sh strip it. What do you say? This is the uh, Gamagatsu T1038. It's a salmon hook, salmon or steel hook. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? I used the tan, but I'm switching to black so that I have a black head on it. Just to finish the head. I forgot my marker. <laughs> I do a lot of the marker thing too. It works really well. Yeah, the little lighter color in between, I kind of like that, how that turned out. Stonefly, simple, messy, buggy. Mm -hmm. 